The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me now in Matthew's Gospel to chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4, we'll be reading verses 1 through 11 there this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and suddenly angels came. And waited on him. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, we pray for ears to hear. Ears that hear your words and not mine. Eyes to see the way you lay before us. Hands and feet willing and ready to serve, hearts open to receive and to give your love. Be with us, Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as as I'm sure most of you probably know by now, this past week I turned 36. But also this past week, I submitted my doctoral thesis to my editor and got it back yesterday. So in just two about two short weeks, uh, some of you are going to have to call me doctor. The rest of you, you know, we'll figure it out. But 36. For that means for about 31 of those years, I have either been in a classroom or planning on being in a classroom or thinking about what classroom I'm going to be in. And, and I've noticed there are a lot of different ways that I learn and a lot of different ways other people learn. There's sort of the, the sort of traditional method of st- sitting in the classroom while somebody like me right now stands in front of you and gives you the information. Some people can do that. Some people can sit in a room and listen to someone drone on for an hour and tell you everything they said. I'm not one of those people, even if it's interesting. And you can go ahead and shake your head and say amen that you can't sit in front of a preacher for 20 minutes and remember anything he or she said. But some people learn that way. Some people learn by reading a book and just sort of absorbing that knowledge. On the table by my bed is a collection of lectures from Stephen Hawking on black holes, because, yeah, I like to party. And (laughs) some people can read that book and come away knowing everything there is to know that Hawking would put in that book about Hawking radiation, the singularity at the heart of a black hole, all this sort of stuff. The only reason I even know those words is because I've read that book, and I've watched videos of Hawking, and I've listened to to podcasts about these things. Again, I like to party. Um, But some people, some people can't read. I can't read a book and just obtain it all. No, the best way I've learned to to learn, the best way I learn, is in that sort of seminar style. After all, most of my education is in the liberal arts, and that's how we did things. You sit around in a room, And yeah, there might be a professor, there might be a facilitator, but guess what you're doing? You're having conversations. You're talking about the topic, the subject at hand. And so I thought, over this season of Lent, following the lectionary still, but yes, it's interesting that in these gospel lessons for all of Lent, these are conversations. 
between Jesus and someone else. Heart to heart talks, if you will, between Jesus and another figure in the gospel story. And what a most interesting one to start off Lent with than Jesus' conversation with the devil. Now, all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have some version of this story. Jesus is baptized, and Mark says he's thrown into the wilderness, driven into the wilderness by the Spirit. But Matthew and Luke say he's sort of led into the wilderness, into the the deserted places. And for 40 days and for 40 nights, whether that's literal or Bible talk for a very long time, it's a long time, and Jesus is there, and Matthew tells us, He's famished. And the devil shows up. I don't know what he looked like. I hope that's not a question you ponder at night. But the devil shows up and tests, tempts, taunts Jesus. If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now, when you first hear that temptation, as I do, you probably think, well, the devil is tempting Jesus with bread. Why? Because he's hungry. He's hungry. Forty days and forty nights, the devil shows up and says, make this, make this stone turn into bread. Can I tell you something? We've all known, we, most of us have heard this story, but can I, t- can I just be real with you for a minute? I, I, I'm disappointed in Jesus. I mean, the devil lays it out there. If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Imagine. Imagine if Jesus would have done it. I don't know what he would have said. Maybe he wouldn't have said anything. Maybe he would have picked up a rock, snapped his fingers, closed his eyes, said a prayer. I don't know. But a loaf of bread. There it is, devil. Proof. He is the Son of God. Maybe if Jesus had done that, then we wouldn't celebrate Good Friday, but, but Stone to Bread Friday. If Jesus had done that, maybe we wouldn't have to celebrate or remember a crucifixion, but rather that time in the wilderness when Jesus showed the devil in the world his power and turned a rock into bread. His power. You see, that's the temptation. It's not hunger. The temptation the devil puts before Christ is to show off. To show me your power. If you are the son of God. How many of you have ever had somebody say to you, if you think you can do it better, and then you think in your mind, oh, no, I can do it better. <laughs> but you don't, do you? Maybe sometimes you do. So what's going on? If you are the son of God, turn these stones. Show me. Prove it. Give me the power. Show me that you can do it, Jesus. That's what the, the temptation is to power. And if Jesus had done it, yeah, he'd have gotten to eat. But maybe, maybe we wouldn't have all this messy, messy Lent stuff. Maybe we wouldn't have to walk in increasing darkness on Holy Week toward Good Friday. Maybe the devil would have recognized his power. Jesus would have come out of the wilderness and said, all right, folks, I'm the son of God. Watch this. And just picks up rocks everywhere, turning them into bread. But he doesn't do it. Instead, he he quotes a psalm. One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. What words come from the mouth of God? Words of scripture? Yeah, yeah. But what are they really? What words, what's at the heart of the words that come from the mouth of God? Are they words that say, if you've got the power to turn rocks into bread, you better do it? Or are they words like, whenever you see a needy neighbor in your land, extend a generous and open hand to them? Are the words of Scripture, anytime you have the chance to show off the power of God, you better do it? Or are the words that come from the mouth of God, 
words that say, welcome the stranger. Are the words that come from the mouth of God words like, love God and your neighbor as yourself? Jesus is not tempted to slake his hunger. Jesus is tempted by the devil to show off his power. And when he doesn't give in, the devil takes another tactic. After all, if the words from the mouth of God are about selflessness, if the words from the mouth of God are about giving yourself up to someone else, what better way to do it than to jump off the top of the temple to prove a point? And so it says, Matthew says, that the devil took him to the holy city, placed him on the top of the temple. In ancient Jerusalem, Herod's temple, the pinnacle of it, would have been the tallest thing around. Now imagine for a moment if this had happened, if Jesus was standing on top of the temple planning to jump. Any of you seen the street magician David Blaine? Anytime he does something, is it just a handful of people that gather around to see if he's going to suffocate in a little ball full of water? No, they all come. Television cameras come. Is he going to die? What is it about us in wanting to see people die? But Jesus is taken to the pinnacle of the temple and the devil says, if you are the Son of God, jump off. And before Jesus can say anything else, it's almost like the devil has his own Bible out. Because it's written, he will command his angels concerning you on their hands. Uh, they will lift you up and you shall not dash your foot against a stone. What's the temptation here? The temptation is the spectacle. If you are the Son of God... As you say you are, the devil says, I've got the scripture to back it up. Jump. Jump. Jump from the highest point as the people watch. And then when the angels catch you, boy, it'll really be something. They'll believe you then. The temptation to spectacle. It happens a lot in the Christian life to those who call themselves leaders in the Christian faith. I won't mention his name, but uh, there was a televangelist who was very popular back in the 90s. If you find him, you can find him on YouTube and then find some other sort of funny videos about him on YouTube. I won't say anything else about that. Um, but there was this clip I saw of him where he was going on. He, he had a call-in radio show. People would call in and tell him about their prayer request and ask him about things. And eventually he would get on a rant about all the things him and his ministry had been doing. And one time he really got to going and said, oh, man, we've seen, we've seen tumors shrink. We've seen the lame walk. We've seen the blind receive their sight. And then he said this, and these are his words, not mine, of him another time. He said, we've seen midgets grow. What? It's the spectacle of the thing. If you can get them in with the language, if you can get them in with the show, that's what God wants. That's what they think. That's what the devil thinks when he tempts Jesus. Jump off the top of the temple. I remember Fred Craddock telling a story about when he was growing up, how these little revivalist preachers would come through his town and, and preach at his church. And he said he remembers one that just captivated him. He came into the sanctuary and there was a cloth over something on the communion table. He couldn't see what it was. And the whole time he said, I didn't sing the hymns. I didn't even bow my head to pray. I just stared at that cloth. What's under that cloth? What's under that cloth? He said, and the preacher got up and he pulled it off and it was a skull. And the preacher went on to talk about hell and damnation. And every time he'd hit a point, he'd clack the jaw on that skull. Every time. He said, I remember the story he told at the end. He said, you want to know how hot hell is? You want to know how long you're going to be in hell? He said, imagine there's a mountain in hell 5,000 miles high. And every 1,000 years, a dove flies by, and the tip of that dove's wing touches the tip of that mountain. He said, when that dove has worn that mountain flat to the ground, it's time for breakfast. That's what he said. It was the spectacle of the thing. How are you going to get them? How are you going to trick them? How are, you going to, uh, how are you going to get their eyes focused on you? The devil says, if it's not about your power, at least make a show of it. He takes them up to the temple to jump off. And Jesus says, no, no. Again, it's written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And so this final temptation... Jesus takes him up to, or I'm sorry, the devil takes Jesus up to a high mountain... 
and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. I don't know what that was. I don't know if he took him up and just sort of scanned him around, if he sort of had this manifested vision, this screen come up. I don't know. But he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to Jesus, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now don't run to the end yet. Think about this temptation. Think about what the devil has offered to Jesus. Everything. Don't even think about the fact whether or not he has the power to do it. He says all of these things. Every nation, every person. I'll give to you. But isn't that the goal? Let's be honest, folks. Isn't that the point? That's what I used to hear. We want every soul, every person in the world to belong to Jesus. Here it is. Every one of them I will give you. Right here, right now. All you got to do, pay me homage, worship me. Imagine. We could, we could have avoided this ugly cross business. We could have avoided words that come later, like if you want to be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. We don't have to do that if there's no cross. Imagine in an instant. Everyone in every kingdom of the world, a Christian, a follower of Jesus. And you can paint that picture however you want in your mind. Maybe they all dress like you, talk like you, think like you. I don't know. I don't care. But in an instant. I mean, that was the goal. That, we're told that's the goal, right? The devil tempts Jesus. Every person, every nation, in an instant. Because that's the temptation, isn't it? The instantness. How many times when you were tempted in your life is at the heart of the temptation, the heart of the temptation is about instant gratification? Even in its most basic sense. I know I got to lose weight. I know I got to work out. But man, cake tastes so good right now. In an instant. I know, I know if I don't spin this right now, I can have it later and put it to better use. But man, I'd sure like to have this right now. At the heart of these temptations, and the heart of every temptation, is the idea that we don't trust tomorrow. We don't trust what's after that we want what's now and in front of us. And the devil offers to Christ everything now. Not the hard work of the cross. Not the hard work of relationship. Not the hard work of building and, and, and moving forward and instilling it in the hearts and minds of those who follow him. But everything now in an instant. And what does Jesus say? Away with you, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. That takes some time. It takes time. It takes the repetitive over and over again of faith. I thought about that this week as I got the candles ready on the table. We do this every year. I mean, should we do something different? Should we, should we not even, I mean, I, when I got in the church, I, we didn't even talk about Lent unless we were talking about cleaning out the dryer. Like, what, what, why, what do we do to do this? Let's just skip all this. Just, let's just talk about Easter this year. But I have the same thing every year around November. Should we really talk about Advent? Should we really, really be doing all this stuff? I mean, we, do the, we read the same stuff every year. We do the same things. But I thought, no, because I don't know about you. But I need to be reminded. I need to be reminded over and over and over again. Not just when Ash Wednesday rolls around, but when the sun rolls around. And I wake up in the morning and realize I didn't do as good yesterday as I have the potential to do today. When I yelled at my kids or when I 
when I got mad at somebody else or when I didn't do what I was supposed to yesterday, I wake up today thinking I can do better today. I can do better today. When someone grates on my nerves or hurts me today, I have tomorrow to forgive and to call and follow on. So much of our temptations in this life is we want it all now. We want it all fixed now. We want what's in front of us right now, right here, right now. Just fix it all. How many times have you prayed that prayer? God, just fix it now. But Lent tells us that it's a call that never fully arrives. It's what the theologian John Caputo says when he describes God as an event. As something in the present that hasn't fully arrived, but is still moving on ahead of us into the future. And reminding us of a past that calls us ever forward. That's what this whole life is. So every time we are tempted to want it now, to fix it now, Christ sits in the wilderness to remind us. But it's a call forward into the difficulty, into the messiness, into the way of the cross. Christ is there calling us, telling us that when the devil tempts us for today, we look the devil straight in the eye and say, not today, Satan, not today. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, help us to learn, Lord, from your conversation, your temptation in the wilderness with the devil. Lord, lead us not into the temptation to fix it all today, to have it all today, to give in to the spectacle of power. But Lord, to rather trust the way of the cross way that leads to a daily self-emptying, to a life lived in selflessness towards you and towards others. Holy Spirit, be with us. Call us, even as we're in this place today, hoping that today it all comes better. Call us ever on to follow you wherever it is you would have us to go. In our presence, Holy Spirit, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord.